Welcome, Christ is Risen. Today, we have a first in a series of conversations about the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Over the next several weeks, we'll approach this topic from historical, political, theological, and a humanitarian perspective with the goal of helping our viewers understand the situation and even how they can respond. First, let me open with the prayer of the season. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling death upon death and bestowing life to those who are in the tombs. We have three very special guests this morning and I'm honored to have them on the program. Gail Walachek is a professor of radiation oncology and associate dean of the graduate student and postdoctoral programs at Northwestern University. Archimandrite Cyril Povoron is a professor of plesiology, international relations and ecumenism at St. Ignatius Theological Academy. And Katrina Straker is the director of development and communications for the International Orthodox Christian Charities, better known as IOCC, leading the teams who work to share IOCC's worldwide efforts to assist people facing hardship and disasters worldwide. There are many questions we have, and we've got, as I said, these guests. So let me start with you, Katrina. We'll begin there. Uh, I want to give our viewers some context about the humanitarian impact of the crisis going on in Ukraine, and it truly is a crisis. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what IOCC has been seeing on the ground in terms of the humanitarian situation? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Father Chris. Um, so uh, I'm really glad to be here so, uh, to share the work that IOCC is doing in and around Ukraine. So um, before I get started, just a brief background on us for those who are not familiar. We are um, the humanitarian arm uh, of the Orthodox Church in the United States. Uh, we're an agency of the Assembly of Canonical Orthodox Bishops of the United States, and we've been around for 30 years. This is our actually our 30th year of service. Wow. And we've been present in more than 60 countries. Um, and in that time and in those countries, we have responded to conflicts um, and in the Balkans and in Syria. And that, that sets us up really to have an um, a informed response here with what is happening uh, in Ukraine. So with that as a background, um, you know, the conflict in Ukraine has affected ordinary people. The infrastructure is being destroyed within the country. And as your viewers well know, this is the biggest displacement of people in Europe since World War II. And um, people have been displaced internally within Ukraine and people have fled to the surrounding countries. Um, people in need are comprised of various different groups, but what we're seeing in particular are women and kids, people with disabilities, um, people with serious medical conditions, and of course, the elderly. Um, People are having a harder and harder time accessing critical services like transportation, food, medicine, even emergency care. So the needs are tremendous, both inside Ukraine and for those who fled outside of Ukraine. And we really anticipate that, that uh, IOCC will be responding for the long term. So we're talking about short term and long term impact mm -hmm. on Ukraine. Yeah. And the region, if the right. situation continues, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right, Father. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, in terms of our humanitarian response um, and what we've seen happen in other conflicts is the needs now will grow. Um, it's known within the international aid community that, that conflicts follow a pattern. The people who can flee early on in a conflict and have the resources to flee do, and maybe they flee to a safer part of the country or maybe they flee the country entirely. Um, and then those with less resources flee at latter points if they can, and, and their needs are compounded. So we expect that, as I said, needs will grow. Okay. So people's lives have been completely uprooted and, and it will take a long time for people to reach a level of normalcy. All right, let's so, look at the, at, at the specific needs, let's say right now, both for Ukrainians still living there and those who have arrived in Europe, I mean, I, I've never seen anything like that, as I said, since pictures, you said, uh, pictures of World War II, where you had thousands of people lined up in train stations, children, one suitcase, bags, whatever they had, trying to get on the train. So let's look at specific needs right now. What, what are they? Sure. Um, so uh, kind of what we're doing with short-term immediate response stuff um, looks different depending on where we are, but it is essentially basics. 
So for people who have fled work, working in three places in particular, we are present in Poland, we are present in Romania, and we are present in Ukraine itself. Okay. So um, what the short-term response looks like in Romania um, right now is, again, provision of basic needs. We are partnering with um, a large national grocery store chain to offer refugees who have fled to Romania food vouchers. So they have the autonomy to get what they need at uh, the local grocery store. Um, in Poland, we're doing distributions of basics like food, water, hygiene items. We are also helping in both of those countries support host families. We have all heard that so many families in Poland and Romania are opening their do doors and hosting refugee families. Um, and they're incredible. so gracious to yeah, do that. Uh, but that also comes with a cost, right? There's a cost associated with that for those host families. So we're supporting those host families in um, the ways that we can with um, access to additional food or cleaning items, things like that, basic, so, so they can continue to welcome people into their homes. All right. Um, in Ukraine, we are also doing basics, and we have for um, almost since the very beginning of, of this conflict. Um, so that looks like access to heating fuel, uh, baby food, baby diapers, water, food for everyone else. Um, but one story I want to share is a project that just wrapped up um, and, and um, we're particularly proud of. It's, it was a tiny project, but I want to share a story about it. So uh, we just finished distribution of Easter baskets to um, uh, displace people inside of Ukraine. We partnered with the diocese, several dioceses inside of Ukraine to distribute these Easter baskets. Um, now in the US, when we think of Easter baskets, uh, you know, we think of candy and toys and trinkets, at least my two little boys <laughs> do, and that's what they're looking for. But in Ukraine, what we knew we needed to do was find a way to kind of do a food distribution um, with these Easter baskets. So we did sausages and cheeses and Basically. eggs, and uh, we even we did a, a treat. We did a traditional Easter cake. Um, so in the Slavic tradition, people often gather their Easter baskets together across Holy Week, bring them to church for a blessing. Uh, but as you can imagine, people who have fled and are, are displaced are in a brand new place. They didn't have the opportunity to do this tradition. So we offer these Easter baskets during Holy Week. Um, and in fact, we just got a note to our general email inbox just this week from a woman who had received one of our baskets and it had our logo on it. And she took the time to look up our website and find our general email. She went to church on Holy Saturday to a brand new parish with people she didn't know. And she said she was so grateful to receive this tiny little blessing of an Easter basket that they didn't have the opportunity to do this year. So I know it's small, okay. but it's... No, no, those are, those are yeah. good things. And, and we'll discuss more about how viewers can respond toward the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I know the parish that I'm currently serving at St. Nicholas here in San Jose, California, in the middle of the tech giant center here. Um, we did baskets and we did uh, those kits and we had all mm. the parishioners lined up on Sunday after church and they were stuffing the baskets. It was, yep. it's just amazing. But we'll talk about that in a minute. I want to go to uh, Dr. Walachek, to, to Gail now. Uh, Gail, when we think of um, nuclear risks, we in the U.S. tend to think more of a risk of a, a nuclear conflict. But there are, I believe, other nuclear risks emerging as a result of the current Russian actions, the invasion. Can you speak about those risks to us? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm obviously a radiation biologist and I've been to Chernobyl many times. I can, I've been, and I'm in touch a lot with the IAEA. And uh, next week, in fact, I'm going to the UN meeting on the effects of atomic radiation. The, the stories are difficult and complex. Um, IAEA was able to get into Ukraine around April 28th and do some reporting on what happened. But let me mention what the problems are, at least right now. I won't mention the problems from the very early part of the bombing. Um, Chernobyl is a very big risk. It is not a functional nuclear reactor at this time, but it has spent fuel rods that are being stored some distance from Chernobyl, actually very close to the Russian border, that are very dangerous. If those were to fall into the wrong hands, they could devastate an area very easily. Um, the second problem is that the Russian soldiers 
I don't know if nobody told them about this or if nobody cared about what happened to them, but they dug trenches in the so-called red forest of the Chernobyl region. That is the most contaminated area on planet earth right now. Um, it, the, the radiation from Chernobyl was buried there for a reason. It was buried to keep there from being exposure to it. They actually dug trenches. They sat in those trenches themselves for probably days. And my calculations are that if they were there for a week, they probably developed acute radiation syndrome, um, which would eventually lead to death untreated. Um, they were sent to Gamal, I understand, in Belarus. But the problem is also for the Ukrainian population, where this radiation has been all stirred up. Um, it is being blown all over the place. It was buried to keep it from being blown. And the monitors for radiation around Chernobyl are not working. They were all uh, affected by the bombing and by the invasion. So they're not there. A greater, another problem that my friends at Chernobyl are telling me is that uh, some of the radioactive materials that they use for testing have been stolen. Yep. So, you know, you know, these are big terrorist uh, possibilities. And one thing that maybe is not always clear in the literature is that the reactor at Chernobyl is very unusual. It was designed to be both for making weapons grade plutonium and also for generating energy. There was a faulty design that led to the problems with Chernobyl, but the fact is there's a ton of plutonium still there, still in the areas around. I saw a NATO report just a couple of years ago that shows huge levels of plutonium there. Plutonium can be sold on the black market for a ton of money, but it's also very dangerous. So that's one of the problems, those are the problems with Chernobyl, at least to this day that exist. Okay. Um, the problems with Zaporizhia are very different. The Russians have brought in P the Zaporizhia plant, which the Russians have taken over. They brought in people that were not really trained in how to work that plant as the operators. I know the IAEA went there. They expressed some concerns. Their report has not been made public and I can't talk about it at all. But what I can say is that the operators there are not certain of what they're doing. And there is a potential for a lot of operator error, which in the Zaporizhia plant could, be, could lead to a lot of uh, danger as well. So I think the radiation dangers in, in Ukraine right now are much greater than uh, we're aware of. And, and as you point out, it's not just about nuclear bombs. I do want to point out one thing about nuclear bombs, though, that is, I think, a mistake that comes out in the literature. Yeah. One of the things that people think is that you can use these sort of like tactical nu nuclear weapons, and they won't cause the same amount of damage as a, you know, Hiroshima type of bomb. But the fact is, the radiation from those bombs, those tactical weapons, is still very extensive, and it's going to blow all over the place. I mean, you know, the, the sale of iodine, which is one of the radio protectors you can take, is out, out of the roof. In fact, you can't find any in most of Eastern Europe right now um, for fear, just for fear of it happening. And even that won't protect against this. We're talking about a devastation that's going to affect tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of people, even if it's a ta tactical nuclear weapon and not the typical huge nuclear weapons we think about. Yeah, we have been hearing uh, that from time to time there were tactical nuclear weapons uh, thrown into the discussion, but let's pray to God we never see that. Uh, let's talk about the, the conflict and its effect on the global Ukrainian community. What has the response been internationally? Could you share that with us? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, the, the great thing is that there's been a lot of unity in the global Ukrainian community. I mean, even... even um, people I didn't expect to hear from, I've been getting emails from. I mean, I th and I think this extends beyond the academic community to the church community and to all other communities. There's a, a big interaction that's going on where people are working with networks to try to create help. I mean, the, you mentioned the fact that, you know, your own parish is doing work in, 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 in the US and Europe, most parishes, not just Ukrainian parishes, but but even um, non, non Orthodox parishes are contributing. I remember, I, I thank God that I was in South Boundbrook the day that the war began. So I was among my Ukrainian friends, but we were doing services and many of the local Protestant churches were coming to join us for church services to show their support. And they've, they've also brought in a lot of, you know, finances and help in that way. There's also a kind of 
university network that's developing. So, um, you know, among the universities, we're trying to come up with approaches to bring in Ukrainian students. And it's being spearheaded by many Ukrainian scholars, but it's also being facilitated by entire universities. So while the scholars may be starting it, so I'm kind of in charge of uh, getting graduate education for Ukrainian scholars in Ukraine, it, 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 that, that it, it's also now become broadened to almost you know, to very, very large groups. So the outpouring has been remarkable and the effect on the Ukraine community, I think has been very uh, uniting, but we are united in our sorrow. That's it. Okay. Well, that's good. That that ecumenical two response is is critical. I think I don't know anyone in their right mind can sit back and say that this is not something we should all be involved in. Um, let's look at the at the long term. Can you conflict? Can you can you comment on what impact the the conflict may have on? I guess it's a sensitive topic, but already strained relations within Orthodox jurisdictions. I mean, how can we as Orthodox Christians abroad now in this sense? In America, we broadcast in 190 countries, but right now we're reaching that audience in America at both the clergy and the lay level. How do we respond to this? Yeah, I think um, it's it's a hard question to address because it's so complicated. Um, it's complicated a lot in a lot of cases by politics. Um, certainly, I will be just honest and say that in the very beginning of the war, I was very hurt at the kinds of responses or lack of responses I saw from many of our hierarchs uh, in the US and elsewhere. Over time, they have added, there are more voices that have been added to the condemnation of what's going on, but there are still some noteworthy uh, lack of responses that we're, see that we're, we're seeing and hearing. And, and I think that that's troubling. For the Ukrainian Orthodox Church as a whole, and probably Father Cyril will be able to comment on this better than I can because he's been on the ground in Ukraine. But you know, I'm a member of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the USA, which is under the Ecumenical Patriarch. And we, of course, were thrilled when uh, the, uh, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine was recognized as um, being under the Ecumenical Patriarch and gave an opportunity there for the church to be kind of independent of Moscow. And it made a lot of sense when this happened Ukraine was being attacked by Crimea. How could Russia even work to protect Ukraine? And if one looks at what Putin has been saying, he is, I mean, he could never lead you know, the Ukrainian church in any way possible um, right. for the, his lack of response. But what's happening in Ukraine is it seems to me that there is a lot of, there are a lot of members of the Ukraine Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarchate who are complaining about what's going on. And at the end of the day, I'm hoping that there will be some sort of unity that comes from that as well. It would, you know, it's a very sad way to have unity come about in, in, in frustration and anger at somebody for how they've responded and at, at the entire church of Moscow for how they've responded here. But I believe it, it, it says what's been going on for many, many years, which is this lack of recognition of, of Ukraine by Moscow. And I will just say, th this is a personal story, but I'm, I'm gonna mention it. Okay. When I was young, I was actually, the representative of the Ukrainian Orthodox League to Sindismus. Okay. And Bishop Kirill was present at that event. And he came up to me personally and attacked me and told me that there were no such things as Ukrainians, that everybody is Russians, and that we are just misnaming ourselves and don't know where we really came from. He said that, and that was like 20, 25 years ago. That was his attitude then. That was the attitude under the Soviet Union. And I believe it has not changed at all. Okay. Um, so it reflects that sort of difficulty. So I probably have answered more than the other question that you wanted me to, so, but um, I think those are the perspectives I have. Those perspectives are, are very, very important. And they come from, as you say, a, a deep seated knowledge and faith uh, in you are Ukrainian and you should be proud of that. There's no reason not to be proud of that. And no one can tell you you can't be. Uh, let me turn over to, uh, to Father Cyril now to add some context about the intersection of politics and theology in the situation from an Orthodox perspective. Uh, Father Cyril, welcome. Please explain what exactly is, I've heard this word, ortho, these words, Orthodox political theology, and how would you frame that in theological terms in this conflict? Uh, right, thank you for this question, and I think it is important uh, in order to understand this war. Uh, I believe personally that, uh, that this war would probably be impossible without some theological input to that, however horrible it may sound. 
uh, but I think the war is underpinned by an ideology which looks like uh, a, a theological conversation, a theological discourses, so to say. And this is a sort of uh, political theology, orthodox political theology, which needs to be analyzed and deconstructed. And instead of it, a new kind of political theology needs to be uh, promoted, uh, a healthier one. Uh, I would just want to draw a parallel with the, uh, with the similar developments in the Western political theology, uh, which is kind of, um, which emerged earlier prior to, to the orthodox uh, political theologies in the West. Uh, the, even, even the term political theology was, was coined in, in Germany in the interwar period by a theologian who supported Nazis. His name was Karl Schmidt. He coined the term politische theologie, the political theology. And uh, he understood this political theology as a way to, uh, to justify you know, totalitar the totalitar totalitarian regime, the Nazi regime, uh, theologically. Um, to a great extent, uh, this, the very term the very expression political theology um, has been compromised since then. And a, lo a lot of people even didn't want to use the word political theology after the World War II. Uh, nevertheless, there was an attempt uh, by some Western political theologians, also in Germany, to reinvent political theology. And uh, they, instead of the old kind of fashioned, the Nazi style political theology of Karl Schmidt, they suggested a new political theology with, which they named the theology after Auschwitz. Mm. Uh, the theology that uh, reflects on the sufferings of the people, on death, on injustice, on, um, on abuse, uh, uh, on um, uh, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of kind of misdoings that one can imagine. Let's, let's, uh, and let's hold on one second. Let's be very clear what you just said. It's very, very important. This is not a theology that gives the right to people to make others suffer. This is a theology that addresses suffering, correct? Exactly. exactly. That's well, very important that people understand yes. that because they may think that this political yeah. theology now gives the right for war, and that's not what we're talking about. Go ahead, please. No, no not exactly. Well, I, what I mean is that the original version of political theology gave right to war to the Nazis. And then this political theology was reinvented after the World War II. And it was uh, reshaped in the way as to rebuke the war, to condemn the war, to condemn you know, the abuses of power. And in the wake of this uh, uh, political theology, the after -war, World War II political theology, which was named also the theology after Auschwitz, as I said, uh, the Western political theology evolved and continues evolving up to our days. In the Orthodox world, uh, we were somehow on the margins of these developments. And uh, um, we had our own bad political theologies in the interwar period. I should, I should remind us that we, the Orthodox, actually did support uh, totalitarian regimes and dictatorships in the interwar period in, in Europe, in, in, in the countries like Romania, like Serbia, like Greece. Um, uh, the, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church uh, complied with the communist regime to, to, to an extent, even though it was persecuted and so forth. And we never had a chance actually to rebuke this sort of political theology, to deconstruct it, and to instead to, uh, to suggest a new sort of political theology which would be healthy, which, we, which would support you know, human dignity, uh, human freedom. Um, and I believe that now this is the, the a chance, kairos, for us, for the Orthodox theologians to come up with this new kind of theology, given that a bad kind of political theology, unhealthy, uh, toxic political theology had led to this war. And this is a nationalistic theology, essentially. This is a sort of nationalism which had been condemned uh, at our at the Council of uh, of the Orthodox Church in 1872 in Constantinople was condemned as ethnopilitism or just philitism, which is literally uh, meaning tribalism. So this kind of tribalism was condemned in our uh, Orthodox Church, and now it come it came up again in the in the form of the Russian world, and this Russian world has been underpinned by a sort of political theology which is similar to the political theology of Karl Schmidt in Germany in the interwar period, the bad mm -hmm. political theology. Okay. And essentially now we need to come up with a sort of political theology which is similar to the theology after Auschwitz, the theology that understands human suffering, the theology that understands human dignity. And I think this is a, a major challenge for us, uh, Orthodox theologians uh, nowadays and, and you know, people of the church, 
uh, to contribute to this new understanding of what we are as the Orthodox people, that we cannot tolerate this kind of war, this kind of violence. Yeah. The problem, as, as Gail uh, has indicated, the problem is that even though everyone sees on the, you know, on TV, on the social media, what is going on in Ukraine, sees, uh, you know, those corpses of people who had suffered and were tortured and died, were executed in blood cold, uh, it, in cold blood, still people just don't take it. And still even the church hierarchs support this war and not just in Russia. I'm not just taking, talking about Russia, but in some other places and churches, Orthodox churches, unfortunately. So we really need to, uh, uh, it's not a matter now of, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, it's not a matter of, you know, uh, it's your opinion, let us let us respect that opinion. No, this kind of attitude to the war is intolerable. We okay. should not, we should not, we cannot stand this uh, this attitude to the war and we, we need to come come up unanimously as the Orthodox theologians, Orthodox people in condemning this war and condemning the violence and condemning actually the abuse of our tradition. Because this abuse, this war is happening in the name of our tradition. And this gives a huge kind of um, uh, blow to, to our tradition. It's, it's really, it, it gives an impression outside that we are like all of us are crazy, you know. All of us are in support of the world. That's why we need to give justice to yeah. justice to the tradition okay. by essentially me, condemning the deviations of it. All right. Let me let me say this. I um, my biggest concern, Father Cyril, is that people see these images over and over and over and over, and they say, "Okay, it's just another conflict happening over and over and over, and it will pass." And that it will pass attitude, I don't think can stand at this point with the devastation. When you see the images, you know these better than I, when you see the images in Ukraine of cities obliterated, there is no way you can justify this, this war. Uh, let me ask you this, Father Cyril. Um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the relationship between um, the Orthodox Church and the state uh, has changed in terms of politics, um, and theology, is the church influencing the government or are government policies and motivations influencing the church? I mean, how do you see these relationships playing out? Yes, thank you for this question. I think it is reciprocal. Uh, there is a, a, an influence of the church upon the government, uh, upon the Kremlin and the influence of the Kremlin upon the church. Uh, for example, the Kremlin has started speaking the language of the church. They said they have started speaking about, you know, the traditional values, the so-called traditional values. They have, st they have started uh, mentioning, you know, the so-called, uh, you know, the spiritual staples, what they call, uh, including orthodoxy. So it's like a, like a glue, a social glue for, for the society. And it is essentially sort of social, uh, civil religion or even political religion. It looks like religion, but it is about politics. So it's something that the church provides to the, to the government, to, to the Kremlin, the language, the narratives to justify the war. And if you, if you watch, for example, the addresses of Putin to, to his people, to the Russians, he uses the imagery and he uses the vocabulary uh, which has been provided by the church to him in order to justify the war. In, and if you uh, now uh, watch the sermons of the patriarch, he uses the sermon, he uses the terminology of the church in order to justify the war again. So essentially what, what we are uh, facing, what we are witnessing <clears throat> in this situation is a sort of <clears throat> convergence of the political discourse, discourses of the, of the government, of the Kremlin, with the theological discourses of the church, to the extent that the church discourses has lost its, you know, orthodox meaning. It looks, it sounds like orthodox, but it's not orthodox anymore. It's political. Well, even, uh, in, are, even its that's... moral authority, even its moral authority to speak, right? Exactly. Well, the church speaks with, with its moral authority and provides the government, the Kremlin, with its moral authority and essentially with the legitimacy for yeah. what the Kremlin does. And this is horrible, exactly, because exactly this is the abuse of our tradition. This is the abuse of the church, which needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Okay. How has, how has orthodoxy been used? Um, we, we touched this, but you may want to touch a little more. To frame, to justify, and to respond to recent events on both sides. The other day, I even saw a picture. I, I don't know if it's true. I can't verify it. But it was a picture set up like an icon with... Vladimir Putin with a gold band around him like a saint and soldiers were going by and kissing that picture. 
I, I can't believe that's true. I want to believe that's not true. But how is how's our faith being used to frame and justify and respond to these events, Father? Well, uh, uh, the, the, the very power, the very political authority in Russia has been sacralized uh, uh, with the contribution of the church. So it is perceived by the majority of the Russians as a sacred institution, something very similar to what, uh, to, what to how it was perceived in Byzantium, essentially. And uh, there are not just pictures of Vladimir Putin, but there was a footage, uh, I recall, uh, of Putin visiting a monastery. Uh, in the north of Russia, and he approached the group of the monks, and one of the priests actually from that group kissed the hand of Putin. Oof. Imagine so, as as he was, you know, a bishop. Uh, so this is a kind of attitude which uh, many in the church have towards uh, towards towards this figure, and uh, many in the society have. So the figure of Putin has been sacralized certainly, and the very power, as I said, uh, the very idea of power has been sacralized, and this is dangerous. That that is exactly a sort of. Uh, a sort of a distortion of our tradition. Even in, in Byzantium, it was not like that. Even in Byzantium, you know, they had uh, some forms of republicanism, of republic, as it has been demonstrated in the recent studies. You know, they didn't have this this, this kind of absolutist, you know, monarchy as Russia has nowadays. Mm -hmm. So this is the extreme uh, where the the the, the Russian, Russian political system has reached and with the support of the state with the support of the church uh, unfortunately and uh, uh, i believe that this kind of abuse again i want to stress it and needs to be deconstructed with the support of theology with the, with the support of, of of the church we cannot just throw away everything we need to really uh, carefully to deconstruct what is wrong about this uh, about this abuse in order to preserve our tradition as it as it is as it was without you know this distortion that happened to it uh, because of the of this unholy alliance between the church and the state in Russia. Okay, um, I want to wrap things up, and I have a couple of questions that I'd like each of our guests today to answer uh, before we move on to their final comments. Uh, first, uh, where can viewers find more information about the conflict as it unfolds? We know we live in a post-truth era, and we know that the people, especially in Russia, are being fed this party line that everything is great and this was uh, some kind of an incursion, not an invasion. And then second, uh, what can viewers do to help? So Father Cyril, let me start with you. Well, it's a, it's a good question. It's really a new thing for us, and there are no many resources. I should uh, should confess, uh, where people which people could 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 easily you know find and and consult. Um, I think it's better really to be uh, to be like in touch. It should be kind of a discussion live discussion and, and they happen already online and uh, we have this meeting with you now we have this discussion which i hope will be helpful for for uh for the orthodox listeners and um, and viewers um also there are uh yes i would suggest for example such uh, venues as a public orthodoxy blog uh, run by um, by the center of orthodox uh, study orthodox christian studies at fordham university in new york city uh, which is very helpful and they, it touches all those, the variety of all those issues. Um, so popular blogs, um, uh, you know, social media, um, programs like this uh, may help. Uh, well, in, soon, hopefully, there will be more publications like books and articles uh, on these issues, but it's, so far it's too, too early to, to have this, uh, this kind of corpus of, of literature. Okay. Gail, how about yourself? Yeah, I'll, I'll say the same thing as, as Father Cyril. I mean, Public Orthodoxy, I think, is a great blog to go to. One thing, even if anybody's interested in the radiation aspect, there are no papers that have come out on this. In fact, I'm an editor of, of a radiation journal, and I've commissioned uh, two people from Chernobyl to write an article about it that would be in language that anybody could understand, but that the, it's still in process right now. So I can't come up with any. It's just too new. It's going to take some time. Okay. And let's go over to IOCC. Katrina. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the best way to stay in touch with what our humanitarian response is, uh, is via our website, IOCC.org. We um, try to keep up to date with um, you know, our responses as they're evolving, because as this conflict evolves and the needs evolve, so do our responses. Um, and then also, you know, um, Father Cyril mentioned it, uh, keeping in touch with us on social media. Okay, very good. Uh, let's offer you an opportunity. I know you've, you've spoken a lot today, but each of you may want to offer some kind of final comment. Father Cyril, we'll start with you. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, well, I believe it's time of a crisis, uh, the crisis in the Greek sense of the word, a crisis as judgment. Uh, and uh, 
it's not a time for you know for for being just lukewarm it's a time for being either cold or, or, or really warm uh, it's a time to be on the side of truth it's it's a time to speak up to be honest uh in in addressing the war it's not a time to hide behind you know silence or behind the euphemisms it's time really to um to uh, to make one's mind about this war and to to speak it up so i i call upon uh, all the orthodox to to show the orthodoxy what they believe and what they believe uh, uh, about their tradition about their mo moral uh, ethics uh, what they believe about jesus christ and what they, they believe about themselves that's your yes be yes and your no be no right yeah. all right gil dr gil let's go to you yeah, I mean, I, I want to say a few things. Number one, I, I want to thank everybody that has given support to the Ukrainian community. The support and the outpouring from everybody has been remarkable. But I also want to point out that a lot of the people that are against uh, that, that are against Ukraine, that are in favor of this war, a lot of them are people that are being politically manipulated. And I'm going to give an example. I was in, I, I go to Serbia often. I have a faculty appointment there. I was in Serbia a little bit after the Crimea occurred. And I was there for January 7th, Christmas. And the priest was giving a sermon. And his sermon that he said was, Underneath all my robes, I have a Putin t-shirt. You should know how important he is to me. On this day, I'm wearing his t-shirt that he gave me as a gift. I think that says something about the kind of political problem that we have to fight. Um, the church should not have to be fighting these political issues. And we need to open everybody's minds and hearts to see what's really happening here and not couch it in some sort of political terms. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Katrina? Um, you know, I, I think for us, our, our mission is to serve people in the most need. Um, that is what Christ has called us to do. And IOCC is uniquely positioned because of our experience over these last three decades. Um, and we're really grateful and feel blessed to be at this point in the growth of the organization right now to be able to respond as quickly and effectively as we are inside and outside of Ukraine. I mean, um, you know, the, the Gail mentioned the support has been tremendous and I will affirm that the support has been tremendous. Um, and because we have had the flexibility that um, the donations and the support has given to the organization, we were able to be on the ground within a week um, and we are still ramping up our projects now. So. Um, I, I think all in all, we're just grateful and thankful that um, we can be a vehicle for Orthodox Christians to be of service, um, a practical service uh, in the world and in a place that's in tremendous need. Very good. I, obviously, this is not something that's going to go away quickly. Mm -hmm. It's going to take quite a bit of time. I want to thank our special guest today for participating in the panel. You can find their full bios at myocn.net. I'm happy to tell you that uh, OCN is doing its part in working with Father Cosmas Carabellas out of Annapolis, Maryland. We'll be sending pocket crosses, thousands of them, to Ukraine and to Poland to be given to Orthodox Christians. We don't know what else to do, but at least we want to give them something that they can hold in their hand and have faith over fear. We look forward to more conversations about this very important topic, including regional history, political drivers, and humanitarian updates as the situation continues to unfold. We encourage our viewers to stay tuned, stay informed, and keep all those suffering in your prayers. The program, as well as others dealing with the critical subject, are being carried and aired by our Ukrainian partner, ATR Media Channel. I'll close with the prayer of the season. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling death upon death, and bestowing life to those in the tombs. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. You can find all of our upcoming events at myocn.net, in addition to daily articles, live worship links, and other resources. The Orthodox Christian Network is a 501c3 corporation and a 100% donor-supported ministry. We rely on donors like you to keep these programs free and available. So if you're able, please consider making a contribution today. And as always, please support us through your prayers and by sharing this content with your friends and family. We hope you'll join us again, and until then, thank you. Thank you.